Hola amigos, and welcome back for another exciting week of Spanish. It is hard to believe that we are already on chapter nine. This has just flown by this whole class. So, but it, it really has been a pleasure getting to work with all of you this semester and getting to know you. And even though it's been virtually, I really feel like I have gotten to know a lot of you all and it's just been a really good experience. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your instructor this semester and hope you've learned some Spanish and we'll take some valuable things on with you to Spanish 2010 and 2020 in the upcoming year. Um, so as we get started here in chapter nine, we are de viaje por el Caribe. We're on vacation in the Caribbean. Doesn't that sound nice? Um, so as we look here, uh, in this chapter, you will learn how to communicate about transportation, lodging, and other aspects of travel. You'll learn how to request and provide information about getting around the city or town, how to give instructions, how to use indirect, direct, and double object pronouns to avoid redundancy, uh, to demonstrate understanding of prepositions and adverbs of location, and to use formal commands and negative two commands. So there's a lot squeezed into this chapter, but fortunately none of it is too terribly difficult really. So that's good. Okay, we're gonna start with some travel words here. And I will say this is like one of the most useful situations in life when you will genu genuinely use your Spanish. Like in an airport, if you ever travel um, abroad, you'll for sure use this. I, I took a group of students to Spain um, and we were fortunate enough, the, the airport, there were many places where there was no English. And, um, you know, fortunately, my students were prepared after having completed a chapter like this on travel. So uh, I think that's great and very important that you do that. Um, here you can see La Agencia de Viajes, the travel agency. Uh, specifically, there is an agente de viaje here. You can have either el agente or la agente depending on whether you have a male or a female travel agent. Uh, here this guy has his maleta, his suitcase. Here you can see someone else going through el control de seguridad, going through security basically. Um, someone here has to facturar el equipaje to um, check your luggage, check your baggage. Uh, this person over here is still having to hacer la maleta, still packing their suitcase, that's not good. Um, and then on this side, you see el agente de la aerolínea, the airline agent. And up here, there's the schedule, el horario, that tells you all the departures and arrivals. And uh, the gate here, la puerta. Um, okay, as we keep looking, you can see the word for plane here, el avión. Uh, as you look on the plane, you see el pasajero, a male passenger, or you could have la pasajera, a female passenger. This person has to abordar, to board. And here on the plane, we have el asistente de vuelo, the flight attendant. Um, over here, depending on your position in the plane, you may have a seat that is uh, un asiento de ventanilla, a window seat, which I always hate those. I can't stand looking out, it makes me nauseous. La ventanilla. Okay, um, as you continue looking here, um, you see this man standing holding his pasaporte, his passport, and you can see the sign says, Bienvenidos a la República Dominicana. Welcome to the Dominican Republic. And so they've just arrived here in the international airport. Uh, this guy still has his equipaje de mano, his hand luggage, or we might say his carry-on. And this woman is going through la aduana, which is customs. So lots of good things happening. Uh, of course, after that happens, if you've ever been to an airport, this is an important part of the process. Hopefully, if it all goes well, you get to recoger el equipaje. You get to actually pick up your luggage and hope and pray that it hasn't been lost in transit, right? So lots of good things. Uh, there are more words, of course, for you to study in your uh, text and with your flashcards. But just to give you an overview, here's a little bit of practice with the vocab. Um, it asks you, um, for some a, a little definition of something and you have to match it with the appropriate word or phrase. So number one, this is por donde se aborda el avión. This is where one uh, boards the plane. Uh, obviously that is the, the port or the gate, so it should be uh, la puerta de salida, letter C. Number two tells us this is el documento para poder entrar en otro país, the document for being able to enter into another country. Obviously you need a passport to do that. Number two should be e pasaporte. 
Uh, I'd like for you to take a moment now and pause your audio, please, and give numbers three, four, five, and six a try. Okay, now that you've got a second to try those, number three says this is el asiento para ver hacia afuera. Ugh, the seat so that you can see outside. That's the window seat. El asiento de ventanilla. F, letter F. Number four, el equipaje que se factura. The, the luggage that you check, um, those are your, your suitcases, your baggage. Uh, in that case, that these would be las manetas, your suitcases. Number five, el lugar donde se mira lo que hay en las maletas. This is the place where you see what is in your bags, where they take a look at what's in your bags. Uh, generally speaking, that is customs or security, but security is not an option here. So it should be customs, la aduana, letter B. And finally, number six, el boleto que se compra cuando uno no quiere volver. <laughs> uh, so the ticket that you buy when you don't want to come back. This is a one-way ticket. Uh, de ida, de ida, letter A, de ida. Okay, so that just gives you an intro to your vocab. Like I said, I love this chapter's vocab. One of my favorites, very useful. One of the grammar topics covered in this chapter is our, um, we have indirect object pronouns. Uh, these are very important. Indirect object pronouns are often translated as to or for in the person. So to or for me, me. To or for you, informal, te. To or for him or her, or to or for you, formal, le. To or for us, nos. To or for you all in Spain, os. And to or for them, or to or for you all, les. So say these with me. Me, te, le. Nos, os, les. So these are your indirect object pronouns. Now, uh, just going back to the grammatical purpose of these. Um, so you know that all sentences have a subject and a verb. Silvia está hablando. Silvia is talking. Silvia is my subject and is is my verb. You know that a lot of sentences oftentimes have a direct object. Uh, that usually answers the question of who or what, which you may remember from a previous video. For example, yo compré el sombrero. I bought who? I bought what? Well, um, I bought the sombrero, so that is going to be a direct object. Some sentences also have an indirect object, uh, which specifies to or for whom, as we said before. So, le compré el collar a Julieta. So, to or for her, I bought the necklace, and it was for Julieta. So, in this case, a Julieta is used to clarify the le usually used together like that. All right. Um, remember your direct object, as we said, answers the question of who or what. Margarita compró un boleto. She bought what? She bought a ticket. Lo compró. We replaced it lo, la, los, or las, generally speaking. Uh, lo and la both mean it, and los and las both mean them. Hopefully you remember these things. Okay. Notice um, that the indirect object uh, can appear in a sentence as well, and um, you generally always see it like this with a clarifier. So, Margarita le compró un boleto a su novio. Margarita bought a ticket for her boyfriend. You cannot say, Margarita compró un boleto a su novio. You cannot put that in there without the le. You have to have the indirect object in Spanish. You have to have that pronoun. So Margarita le compró un boleto a su novio. In this case, the a su novio part just clarifies the le. If you didn't have the a su novio, you could just say Margarita le compró un boleto. So Margarita bought him or her a ticket, but we don't know who the him or her is. So you have to have the asu novio to clarify that. Okay. Um, some more examples here. Um, mama llama todos los días. So mom calls every day. Well, she calls whom? Who's she calling? Uh, you kind of have to specify that a nosotros mama nos llama todos los días. She calls us nos llama. Another example. Manny compró un boleto para ella. So Manny bought a ticket for her. Uh, you can rewrite that, but le compró un boleto. He bought a ticket to or for her. Okay, so just more examples. Um, 
our placement situation for these indirect object pronouns is the exact same as our placement for the direct object pronoun. So it always goes in front of your conjugated verb. As you see here, I gave her the jacket, yo le di, la chaqueta, I to or for her gave the jacket, di is my conjugated verb, so my indirect object pronoun must come in front of that conjugated verb, yo le di la chaqueta. If you have a negative sentence that has a no, um, again, you're just going to find that conjugated verb and place your indirect object pronoun in front of it. So no nos compraron el regalo. They did not buy the present for us. Compraron is our conjugated verb, so our, our indirect object pronoun of nos must come in front of that. Okay. Um, now, as I said, generally, ever in doubt, always put it in front of your conjugated verb. That works for pretty much most of the things we talked about in this class. If you're ever unsure, stick it in front of your conjugated verb. However, there are other options, and I want you to be aware of those options. Um, so if you're using one of these indirect object pronouns with an infinitive or a present participle, you have the option of attaching it to the end of that infinitive or to the end of that gerund, that present participle. So for example, I'm going to give her the ticket. Le voy a dar el boleto is the safest way to do it. You found your conjugated verb voy and you put your indirect object pronoun of le directly in front of that conjugated verb. Le voy a dar el boleto. However, uh, if you want to be fancy, you have the option of attaching it to your infinitive. So you could say voy a darle el boleto. In this case, my indirect object pronoun le has been attached to the infinitive dar, to give. Okay? Um, some more examples here again. Um, sometimes when you're using a command, and we will talk more about commands in just a bit, but when you're using a command, you generally always attach the indirect object pronoun to the end of the verb. So for example, you learned about two commands back in Spanish 1. Uh, hablar, for example, became habla, talk. You want to say talk to her, hablale. You attach the le to the end of the verb. Only with commands do you do this. Otherwise, it always goes in front of the conjugated verb. Another example, give me the papers now. Dame, give me. Dame los papeles ahora. Um, now, that's only with positive commands that you can attach to the end. If you have a negative command, you have to put your indirect object pronoun in front of the conjugated command basically between no and the verb. So for example, don't talk to her, no le hables. The le comes in front of hables. No me des los papeles todavía. Don't give me the paper shit. No me des. So your indirect object in that case is coming in front of your verb. All right. Um, some other things you need to know here. With le and les, your meaning in your sentence can be a little ambiguous, meaning that we don't always know who you're talking about. So le, again, can mean to or for him, to or for her, or to or for you formal. Les can mean to or for them, or to or for you all. So if you want to clarify in your sentence who you're talking about, you generally use a personal a, followed by the name. So a él, to or for him. A ella, to or for her. A usted, to or for you formal. Um, in the sentence here, you see, le prometiste el viaje a él o a ella. Did you promise the trip to him or to her? Le prometí el viaje a ella. I promised the trip to her. So again, the le kind of has to match up with a ella. It's a very common way to see that. Okay. Um, you also may include these for emphasis where you use... Um, the indirect object and the personal on the same sentence, a lot of times it is for emphasis. So look at these three sentences. Te doy este regalo. I will give you this present. A quien le das el regalo? To whom are you going to give the present? Te doy el regalo a ti. So uh, I'm going to give you this present. Oh, who are you giving the present to? I'm going to give this present to you. Like you're you're clarifying, you're, you're specifying that it's to you, right? Um, so a little bit more emphasis there. Um, if you're wondering, like, if there are verbs that commonly use these indirect object pronouns, indeed there are. Um, these verbs are dar, to give, decir, to say, 
escribir, to write, and explicar, to explain. It makes sense here that these would be the most commonly used verbs with indirect object pronouns because you are going to give it to someone. You're going to tell something to someone. You're going to explain it to them. So it would make sense that you would use um, indirect object pronouns most commonly with those verbs, right? Um, okay, last thing about the grammar notes here. When we use these indirect object pronouns with an infinitive or with a present participle like a gerund, an ing word, again, you can place the subject pronoun or the indirect object pronoun, you can place it before your conjugated verb, nos quieren, for example, or te estoy viendo, or you can also attach it, quieren cantarnos, estoy viendo te. Um, so again, if you're ever unsure, just put it before the conjugative verb, but attaching it is indeed an option. I want to give you some examples with these. Um, this is what you're going to have to do this week in MindTap. And again, you generally see in parentheses the clarifier as to who you're talking about. So it has yo blank, escribo postales del Caribe a mis abuelos. So I am writing postcards from the Caribbean to my grandparents, to my abuelos. Well, two or four my grandparents would be two or four them. We know that the indirect object pronoun that goes with two or four them should be les. So yo les escribo postales del Caribe. Another example, number one. Yo blank hago muchas preguntas a la gente de viaje sobre Santo Domingo. So I ask a lot of questions to the travel agent about Santo Domingo. I'm asking I am, two or for him, to the travel agent. So we know that two or for him in Spanish. Uh, if you go through your indirect object pronouns, me, te, le, nos, os, les, two or for him should be le. So for number one, you should put yo le hago muchas preguntas a la gente de viajes. Okay, for the sake of time, I want you to try uh, just numbers two and three. Very quickly, go ahead and pause your audio and give these a try. All right, now you've got a second to try these. Number two, El Blank recomienda visitar la Fortaleza Osama, que fue la primera construcción militar de América. So he recommended to me. So to or for me in Spanish is just simply me, M-E. So él me recomienda. Number three, yo Blank prometo comprar cosas típicas. Um, so I promise to you, and it says at the end of the sentence, a ti. So I promise to you, yo te prometo, te. Okay, so I think you have a good understanding of indirect object pronouns. And from before, I know you have a good understanding of direct object pronouns. So now, this is where it gets tricky. We're going to put all these things together in the same sentence for what we call double object pronouns. So one more time as a summary, our direct object pronouns answer the question of who or what. Usually you see them most commonly used as lo, la, los, and las, but they can also be me, te, nos, or os. Those are your direct object pronouns. Your indirect object pronouns answer the question of to or for whom, and they are me, te, le, nos, os, or les. So um, this helps to eliminate redundancy in conversation because you can use them together. For example, will you get me a towel? Instead of saying, yes, I will get you a towel, you can say, yes, I will get it, referring back to the towel, for you. So in this case, it would be my direct object, referring back to the towel, it, and to or for you would be my indirect object. Okay, so will you get me a towel? Yes, I'll get it for you. Another example, hey, would you bring me some snacks? Sure, I'll bring them, them referring back to the snacks, for you. So them is my direct object, and um, for you is my indirect object. Okay, and you can see I've color coordinated those for you with the direct objects in purple and the indirect objects in that yellowish orange color. Okay, here's another example from a little photo. Uh, this guy looks like he has a broken racket and he says, Me prestas tu raqueta? Would you let me borrow your racket? And this guy's this 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 person says, Claro, of course. Te la presto. To or for you. It I will lend. 
So, claro, te, two or for you, it, la, I will end. Uh, this structure, the way you see these ordered, is very common. You always, when shortening these in conversation, include the indirect object pronoun before the direct object pronoun, and they generally always come before the conjugated verb, as we've said. So, indirect before direct. Te la presto. Some more examples here, uh, and I said this before, indirect before direct. Reflexives come first of all. If you do have a reflexive, they'll go first. It's uncommon that you'll have one, but indirect before direct. Uh, in an example here, Julian me traes la película. So Julian, would you bring me the movie? And he's going to say, yes, I will bring it to you. So traigo, I will bring, is my conjugated verb. I need to put my indirect and my direct object pronouns in front of that conjugated verb in the sentence, and we know that the indirect comes first. Indirect before direct reflexes first of all. So, hey, will you bring me a movie? Yes, I'll bring it to you. So, to or for you in Spanish is going to become te. And I'm bringing you it, referring back to the movie, la película, which is feminine singular. So, we can shorten it feminine to la. So, you should end up with te la traigo. Okay. Um, this is where things get a little tricky. Um, now, just like everything else we've talked about, if you don't want to put it in front of your conjugated verb, you have the option of attaching it to the infinitive, <coughs> excuse me, or attaching it to the present participle. Both of those are completely acceptable. So in our question here, we see, hey, Carlos, ¿puedes traerme la bolsa? Are you able to bring me the bag? So in this case, the indirect object pronoun, me, meaning to or for me, is attached to the infinitive traer, which means to bring. Um, Carlos responds and he says, yeah, voy a traértela enseguida. So again, we've attached it to the infinitive of traer. Our indirect object pronoun te still came before our direct object pronoun la. So voy a traértela enseguida. I'm going to bring it to or for you right away. Note, if you don't like it that way, you could put it in front of your conjugated verb in this sentence. What's my conjugated verb in my first answer here? It's voy. So if I wanted to rewrite it, indirect before direct, I could say, te la voy a traer enseguida. Okay? So again, if you don't like attaching it, you can always put it in front. Another example that you see here, um, in, in answer two, the object pronouns have been attached to the present participle, the gerund. So, hey, Carlos, will you bring me the bag? Yeah, estoy, estoy buscándotela ahora mismo. So, yeah, yeah, I'm looking for it for you right now. Estoy buscándotela. Again, indirect before direct, the te comes before the la, and it's attached to buscando. Um, if you don't like it like that, you could rewrite it, putting it in front of your conjugated verb and say te... La estoy buscando ahora. Notice, if you do choose to attach it, instead of putting um, it in front of your conjugated verb, you have to include a written accent on the stressed vowel in the verb when it's attached. So, traértela, the accent's on the E. Buscándotela, the accent's on the A, as you can see underlined there. Um, here is what gets a little tricky. So, um, the fancy grammar terminology for this is that whenever you have an indirect object pronoun in the third person, the layer lace, you're going to change that layer lace to say when it precedes a direct object pronoun that also begins with an L, such as lo, la, los, or las. In more simple terms, um, you may recognize the TV show from below, uh, Lilo and Stitch. Uh, they're the only time in life you can Lilo or Lelo, okay? So in Spanish, there's an issue with the double L, like being right beside each other. You can't Lelo, Lela, Lelos, or Lelas. In that case, the L in Le changes to Se. So you end up with Celo, Cela, Celos, and Celas. I know that's complicated, so let's look at some examples. We're asking here, ¿Quién les trae 
la pelota a los jugadores. So who to or for them brings the ball? And we're referring to the players. So who brings the players the ball? Well, we know a los jugadores is referring back to the lace. Those match up as they should. And la pelota is the ball, it. So we're going to answer this sentence of who brings the players the ball. And we're going to say that the trainer or the coach brings it, the ball, to them, the players. Okay, so the trainer, to or for them, the players, los jugadores, would actually become lace, to or for them. And the ball, la pelota, which is feminine singular, will become la. So our problem here is that we can't lace la because you can't have uh, the L sound is an issue with double object pronouns. So in this case, your lace is going to change to se. So el entrenador se la trae. Okay, another example. Hace frío afuera y necesito unos guantes. It's cold outside and I need some gloves. A quien blankety blank pido. To whom should I ask for them? Well, what's the them we're talking about here? Gloves, guantes, which we know are masculine. So guantes, to say them masculine, we're going to replace those with los. And to whom, one person, he or she, to or for him or her, we're going to use le, right? But the problem here, we can't le los. So we're going to need to rewrite this sentence and say a, a quien se los pido. To or for whom should I ask for them? All right, I know these are hard, so let's do a few more examples. Um, I like these a little better. Give you some more choice. El camarero me trae el menú. So the waiter, to or for me, brings the menu. You're trying to say that the waiter brings me it. We know that it we're talking about here is el menú, which is masculine. So we can automatically cross out letter B because el menú uh, it's masculine is going to become lo. So it has to be either A or C. We're saying the waiter brings who the menu again? The waiter brings me the menu. So el camarero me lo trae should be the correct answer. Okay. I want you to take a moment, pause your audio, and give numbers two, three, and four a try for me, please. Okay, now that you've got a second to try, number two says compro los libros para ti. So I buy the books for you. Well, two or for you in Spanish we know becomes te, so I can cross out letter B. I'm buying you what again? Oh, the books. The books would become them, right? There's multiple books. So them, masculine, should become te los compro. Notice in each of these your indirect comes before your direct, and those precede your conjugated verb. Number three, le escribo una carta a mi novio. So I am writing a letter to my boyfriend. Well, two or four my boyfriend would be two or four him, right? So I know that it's gonna be le, two or four him. So let's start with that. We'll just write that in, le. I'm writing him what again? I'm writing him a letter, una carta, which is feminine and singular. So it feminine, we're going to put la. But remember, you can't lelo, lela, lelos, or lelas. So my le in this case is going to change to se, and you should end up with se la. Kind of tricky, I know. All right, number four. Pagamos la cuenta a Julio por su cumpleaños. So we're going to pay for the check for Julio for his birthday. So we're going to pay for it. The it, in this case, is la cuenta, the check, which is feminine and singular. So we're going to replace it feminine with la. All of them have la, so I can't mark anything out. We're paying for it for Julio, to or for him. So that would be Leila. However, we know we can't lelo, Leila, lelos, or Leila. So in this case, the le is going to change to se, and you should get Sela. Okay? Hopefully you're starting to feel better about how these double object pronouns work in Spanish. Our next area of emphasis here is in regard to lodging in a hotel, also related to travel. So you can see these go in order, starting with one and going over to two. Uh, let's just go through and read these quickly together. 
Uh, you see the receptionist here, and he says, Muy buenas tardes. En que puedo servirles? So, very good afternoon. In what way may I serve you all today? How can I help you guys today? And uh, the, the woman here says, well, necesitamos un cuarto para dos personas. We need a room for two people, please. And the guy says, si, sí, con cama doble, por favor, vamos a quedarnos tres noches aquí. So yeah, with a double bed, please, or you might say like a queen-size bed. Con una cama doble, por favor, a double, a double bed. We're going to be staying here for three nights. And uh, the host, the receptionist here, he says, well, ¿desean ustedes un baño privado? Would you guys like to have a private bathroom? And um, he says, si, sí, con ducha. Yes, please, with a shower. And um, she responds and says, Por favor, queremos un cuarto que no dé a la calle. Hay mucho ruido por aquí. So, please, we would like to have a room that doesn't have access to the street. Um, is there a lot of noise here? And he says, Sí, señora, por el transito, because of the public transportation. Their conversation continues, and um, the man here asks, well, ¿Tiene aire acondicionado el cuarto? Does the room have air conditioning? And he says, sí, señor. Todos los cuartos lo tienen. El Hotel Nacional de Cuba es de cuatro estrellas. So, yes, sir, all of our hotels have it. Notice the use of that direct object pronoun there, lo, referring back to aire acondicionador. So he didn't have to repeat himself. He just said it. So, yes, sir, all of the rooms have it. Uh, the National Hotel of Cuba is a four-star hotel, which is a, a big deal in European and, and just other countries in general. That's sort of the equivalent of our five-star. Okay, um, in number four here, uh, the guy asks, well, okay, great. ¿Cuánto cuesta el cuarto? Well, good. How much does the room cost? And the guy says, oh, it's $120 a day, sir. And uh, as we can see in the next uh, expression on their faces here, uh, she says, ooh, Eso es mucho, señor. Oh my gosh, that's a lot, sir. And um, the man pipes in and he says, well, um, pues hay un cuarto más barato por 75 dólares, pero no tiene cama doble. He says, well, you know, there is another room that's cheaper. It's only $75 a night, but it doesn't have a double bed. And uh, the, the husband here pipes up and he says, well, Es nuestro luna de miel. It's our honeymoon. And creo que podemos permitirnos un cuarto grande y cómodo. It's our honeymoon. And I think that we should uh, reward ourselves here with a big bed and a big comfy bed. So uh, they made their decision. The man gives them a key and he says, Aquí tienen su llave. Here is your key, your llave. Para el cuarto matrimonial. Here's your key for the the matrimony room, or you might say like the honeymoon suite. Uh, sé que les va a gustar. Es el cuarto 204. So I know you're going to love it. You're going to like it. It's room 204. So they head on up. Um, the woman asks, well, hay ascensor? Is there an elevator? And he says, como no, señora. Of course, ma'am. Está allí a la izquierda. It's there to the left. And and uh, so now they get up to their room, and uh, the woman says, ay, El cuarto es un desastre. No está arreglado y está muy sucio. You can, you can see there by looking around the room. She says the room is a disaster. It is not organized, arreglado, or prepared. And it's very dirty, as you can tell from all those things sitting around. Um, the husband's on the phone and he says, El recepcionista dice que los recién casados generalmente no se quejan de las condiciones del cuarto. The receptionist says that uh, the newlyweds generally don't complain too much about the conditions of the room. Uh-oh. All right, so you get to see all of those there. In an activity in MindTap this week, you may be asked to take a definition such as this. And, um, or I'm uh, sorry, you may be asked, yes, you may be asked to take a definition such as this and provide a, pearl, a, a vocabulary word that corresponds. So for example, the model says, nosotros dormimos in esta cosa. We sleep in this thing. Well, we sleep in a bed, in la cama. Um, another example, number one. Es una cama para una persona. It's a bed, but it's a bed for only one person. Well, that's a twin bed 
or a single bed. Una cama sencilla. Okay. Number two. Entramos en esto para subir o bajar. So we go inside of this, we get in, we got on this to go up or go down. Well, it sounds like an what? Good. Hopefully an ascensor, an elevator, an ascensor. Um, I want you to pause your audio and give numbers three and four a quick try for me. All right, now that you've had a chance to try, number three says, In este lugar uno se registra. So uh, in this place, one registers. Will you register for your room in el recepcionista? La recepcionista, la recepción, the reception area, right? With the receptionist. Uh, number four, es un baño que no hay que compartir con otros. It is a bathroom that is not to be shared with others. That is a baño privado. A private bathroom, un baño privado. Okay. Um, the final topic I'm going to talk to you about today is commands. Okay, we're going to talk about formal commands and um, also negative two commands. You already learned about positive two commands back in Spanish 1010. Remember those positive two commands. Use your bottom left box, the el, ella, usted box. So hablar, for example, would become habla. Comer would become come, beber, bebe so on and so forth, your negative commands follow a different process. And the rule of thumb here um, is to form the yo form of the verb, drop the o in the yo form, and add the opposite ending. And what I mean by opposite ending, if you're dealing with an ar verb, you're going to add the normal verb endings for an er or an ir verb. If you're dealing with an er verb, then you're going to use the normal verb endings for um, an AR verb. So it's it's always using the opposite index. Since these are always usted or ustedes commands, all these are going to be using that bottom left and that bottom right box. Okay, so we're going to start with a very basic verb like hablar to talk. Hablar is an AR verb, right? So let's let's follow the process. Form the yo, hablo, yo form the present tense, by the way, form the yo, drop the o, h a b l and add the opposite ending. So normally, my bottom left box, and, and I can put a box up here just to let you visualize it. Um, normally, if we were dealing with our endings, uh, we would be using these bottom two boxes, right? The usted box would be this bottom left box, and the ustedes box would be this bottom right box. Normally, for an AR verb, my endings would be A and AN, but I'm doing the opposite, because this is an ER, um, it's an AR verb, so I'm using the opposite ending. So instead of an A, I'm going to use an E. Instead of an AN, I'm going to use an EN. So notice, uh, if you're telling someone formally to talk, you're going to say, usted hable. Hable usted, hable, talk. Um, if you're telling a group of people to talk, hablen, with an EN. So you use the opposite ending. So if it's an AR verb, it uses ER, IR endings. If it's an ER, IR verb, it uses AR endings. The cool thing about making these negative, hable, speak. No hable, don't speak. You just throw a no in front of it. Hablen, you all should talk. No hablen, stop talking, right? Um, so pretty simple there. So remember, form the yo, drop the o, and add the opposite ending. Okay, there are irregulars, like with everything else, you may recall back to our preterite lesson uh, earlier this semester where we learned about car, gar, and zar verbs. And you learned that car verbs change to que, gar verbs change to ge, and zar verbs change to se. That same sort of thing holds true here. So when you take a verb like sacar, um, in the usted form, the command is going to be saque. Um, in this case, it is the c that just changes to a qu. But if you want to think about it as counter changes to K, that's okay. That works for the usted form. But for the ustedes form, you do have to add the opposite ending, so it would be sakin with an en, because normally you know your ending would be an, so you're using the opposite en. So sacar, sake, sakin. Same thing with llegar. Gar changes to ge, so llegue, arrive, or you all arrive, lleguen. And same thing with comenzar. Uh, Zar verbs change to say, basically the Z is just changing to a C. So, comience, comiencen. Not too bad there, right? 
Um, there are several irregular commands, and these are ones you just have to memorize, unfortunately. Dar becomes de in the usted form, and den in the ustedes form. Estar becomes este in the usted form, and estén in the ustedes form. Ir becomes vaya in the usted form, and vayan in the ustedes form. Saber becomes sepa in the usted form, and sepan in the ustedes form. And finally, ser becomes sea in the usted form, or sean in the ustedes form. And again, to make any of these um, negative, you simply just need to add a no in front. So not too bad. Okay. Um, I also want to talk to you about negative two commands. They follow the same process. So remember, positive two commands use your bottom left box. Negative two commands still use this normal two box over here, and they follow the same process as your formal command. So you're going to start by forming the yo, dropping the o, and adding the opposite ending. So go back to hablar. Form the yo form of hablar. Hablo. Drop the o. H-A-B-L. Add the opposite ending. In the to form, for an AR verb, your ending would normally be AS. Or, if it were an ER and IR verb, it would be ES. So, we're using the opposite endings again. So, form the yo, hablo, drop the O, H-A-B-L, and add the opposite ending. So, instead of hablas, it's going to be hables, ES. Uh, and, of course, this is a negative command, so you need to know in front, no hables. Let's take another example here. Let's say we were dealing with uh, comer, to eat. We're going to form the yo, como. We're going to drop the o, com. We're going to add the opposite ending. So, c-o-m-e-s, we've got a normal ending. The negative form is going to be no comas. No comas. Don't eat. No comas. Okay. Uh, you can see a chart here displaying all of these things. If you're thinking it's weird that we form the yo before we drop the o, the reason why is when you have all those irregular yo verbs like dormir um, and poner and some of those, you have to form the yo, otherwise you'll miss the stem change. So that's why those are there. And just to let you practice a little bit here, um, these are negative two commands again, just more of those. Number one says that no tratar de hacer una expedición solo. Don't try to do an expedition alone. Well, we're going to form the yo, trato, drop the o, and add the opposite ending. This was an ar verb, so normally we would use as, but we're going to use the opposite ending. We're going to use es, so you should get no trates. Okay? I want you to take a moment, pause your audio, and I want you to give numbers two and three a try for me, please. Okay, now let's spend a second to try these. Number two says, no creer. Todo lo que oyes de los naufragios. Don't believe everything you hear about blah, blah, blah. So we want to say don't believe. We're going to start by forming the yo form of creer, which is creo. We're going to drop the O, C-R-E. We're going to add the opposite ending. This is normally an E-R verb, so normally we would use E-S. We're going to use the opposite ending. We're going to use A-S, no creas. Okay. And finally, number three, uh, hopefully you caught this. Number three is a car verb, so it's going to fall into that weird category we talked about. Um, so, no buscar la respuesta más obvia a los misterios. Don't look for the most obvious answer to the mysteries. Um, you can start by forming the yo, busco, dropping the o, b-u-s-c, adding the opposite ending. It was an a-r verb, so normally you would use a-s. But we're using the opposite ending, ES. So you get B U S C E S. We know, however, that car verbs change to K, and really that the C just changes to a Q U. So that is what we're going to do. We're going to change our C to a Q U. Okay? Um, just to make sure you're feeling uh, prepared for these, I've mixed them all together for you here again. Uh, these are formal commands. You know that by reading, we're talking to Señor Presidente, Mr. President. So when we greet the president of a college or of the United States or a company or whatever, we're definitely going to use the usted form, especially if we call him Señor Presidente, right? 
So we're saying, Mr. President, usted tiene un día muy ocupado. You have a very busy day. Y es importante seguir las instrucciones de seguridad. It's very important that you follow the security instructions. Primero, abrochar el cinturón de seguridad en el carro. So the first thing you should do is fasten your seatbelt, el cinturón de seguridad, in your car. So we're doing a new stead command. So we're going to take abrochar. We're going to form the yo, A-B-R-O-C-H-O. We're going to drop the O. And we're going to add the opposite ending. Remember, usted is our bottom left box. So normally our ending would be an A. However, we're doing the opposite ending, so we should add an E here. So primero, abroche el cinturón de seguridad. Okay, let's do one more. Solamente hablar con su familia por teléfono. Especial. Um, so just talk. Solamente hablar con su familia. Just talk on your phone with your family. So hablar, we're going to form the yo form. Hablo, drop the O, and the opposite ending. Normally we would add an A. This is the usted, bottom left box, right? But we're going to add the opposite ending, so we're going to add an E here. Hable. All right, there are three more left. Please take a moment, pause your audio, and give these last three a try. Okay, amigos, now that you've had a moment to try, um, so we've said, just talk to your family on the phone. And especially, do not use uh, your normal cell phone. So, we're taking the verb usar. We are going to go through and form the yo, uso. Drop the o and add the opposite ending. This is an AR verb, so normally we would add an a. We're going to add the opposite ending, so it should be no use. Don't use. Uh, as we continue, en la cena esta noche, comer la sopa. So, for dinner tonight, eat soup. Uh, comer is our verb. We're going to form the yo, como, drop the o, add the opposite ending. Normally we would add an e, but we're going to add the opposite ending, so it should be coma with an a, coma. Same thing with the last one. So uh, for dinner tonight, eat some soup, but don't drink a lot of wine. No beber el vino, porque usted necesita estar preparado mentalmente para la reunión después de la cena. So don't uh, drink a lot of wine because after dinner, you need to be mentally prepared for the meeting. So again, with beber, we're going to form the yo, bebo, drop the o, and add the opposite ending. So beber was an er verb. Normally, we would add an e, but instead, we're going to add an a. So you should get beba. Okay, guys, this concludes uh, our final video of Espanol uh, 1020 that we've taken together, Spanish 2. And guys, it's just been a great pleasure working with you. Of course, if at any point you have questions about this or anything else, or if you ever need a recommendation letter, whatever it is that you need, I'm always happy to help you out. Uh, my email is mtharrison at pstcc.edu. And um, finally, of course, in this video, you have come full circle. You've learned how to communicate about transportation, lodging, and other aspects of travel. You've learned how to request and provide information about getting around a city or town, how to give instructions, how to utilize direct, indirect, and double object pronouns to avoid redundancy, how to demonstrate understanding of prepositions and adverbs of location, and how to utilize formal commands and negative two commands. Guys, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day.